Welcome to Chamber Talk. My name is Heath Taylor. I'm the President and CEO at the Dublin Lawrence County Chamber of Commerce. And my special guest today is Miss Mary Alice Morrow with the Carl Vinson VA Medical Center yes. here in Dublin. And, and Dr. Frank Jordan, thank you both for joining me today on the show. Oh, uh, we have so much to share with you today. I'm really excited about having both of you because of all the wonderful things that are happening at the VA. Um, and we talked a little bit earlier before we came on camera, even about it, it's almost like it's its own little city mm -hmm. um, here in Dublin, and, and yeah. there are so many wonderful things. And, and first and foremost, let me ask you, Mary Alice, where are we in employee count um, right now, a, a ballpark estimate? There. Yes, thanks. That's a good question, Heath, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, right now, latest count is 1349 total employees. Now, uh, they're not all here in Dublin, Lawrence County. We have our uh, our big facility here in Dublin, and then we have six outlying outpatient clinics um, scattered throughout 52, well, they're in six other counties, but uh, we serve 52 counties in middle and south Georgia. Fantastic. Yeah. Wow, that's exciting. Okay, um, Mary Allison, and we're going to get some questions for you, Dr. Jordan, sure. as well. Um, we have a, a transition that's taking place right now at the VA hospital that I think would be very important for our viewers to know about, and, and that's concerning the emergency department. Right, right. So um, for many years, uh, both uh, the local leadership here in Dublin and uh, at our regional headquarters in Atlanta have been studying um, you know, the, 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 the use, volume, access of our facility here in Dublin as a, as a small community hospital. And uh, we made a decision at the end of last calendar year to uh, restructure some of our services. The first thing we did was we closed our intensive care unit. And the second part of that is to restructure our emergency department into an urgent care clinic center. Uh, and the reason that we're doing that is if you look at, at the way our veterans use our facility, again, we, you know, when you talk about what our footprint is, we serve the 52 counties. So there's about 38,000 unique veterans that we serve that actively use our services both here and in our, in our outlying clinics on any given day. Um, so really less than half of them are here in Dublin. And that uh, does not provide a high volume of, of beneficiaries that may need those high level acute services such as critical care, emergency care, et cetera. We were averaging less than, less than two patients a day in our intensive care unit. And 95, 97% of what comes through our emergency department is indeed urgent. So it's not, it doesn't rise to the level of true emergent care. We don't have the high level of support specialties, the, the critical surgical services and the upper level acuity for critical care um, to, to complement a full service emergency room and, or the volume of patients to support it. So uh, we thought it was in the best interest of the veterans that we serve here in, in Lawrence County to restructure our emergency department to an urgent care clinic. It shouldn't mean that, it shouldn't make that much difference to the veterans that typically use us on any given day because as I said, the majority of the volume of veterans that we see in that unit come in for urgent care and will continue to provide that service. Our emergency department's currently a 24-7 operation. We will decrease that to 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. because we average overnight you know, in the midnight hours, only one or two veterans that, that utilize us after hours. And, and as, as before and as now, we always uh, encourage our veterans to go to the closest emergency room should they have an emergent need, chest pain, heavy bleeding, um, anything with, a, with an eye, uh, you know, any kind of loss of consciousness, stroke, those kind of things. Okay. They, they need to go to the emergency room. Our partners here in Dublin, Fairview Park, uh, you know, they've been expanding and building, and they mm -hmm. have uh, the higher level of surgery. They have the high level of acuity in their critical care, in their emergency room. And so really, we think the veteran would receive uh, a better service in a place, in a facility that's more prepared to handle those, those higher acuity services. So that's, uh, and they certainly have the ability to absorb uh, the true emergencies that we normally send them anyway from our emergency room currently because of, of the need for higher levels of service. So it shouldn't mean uh, a great difference to our veterans that readily use us anyway, but um, the biggest difference will be we won't be open from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. And this transaction or transition, I would say, um, period should be completed still uh, November on track 15th. November? November okay. 15th okay. is the day that we'll switch. So we'll go from a 24-7 to a 12-hour operation um, at, redesignated as an urgent care clinic, not an emergency department. The biggest difference to the community is uh, ambulances will no longer arrive with patients that right. need emergency care. They'll go right to Fairview. Okay, and, and let me ask you if I'm riding down Veterans Boulevard and, and I start having chest pain, 
can I come to your hospital or do I need to try we, to make it over to Fairview? Anyone that comes in our doors with an urgent issue, we will provide humanitarian care uh, and stabilize until we can transport you to another facility. Uh, we are designed to, to provide care to veterans, but in an emergency, um, you know, our own staff, if they have an emergency, will certainly so they uh, wouldn't say, Sorry, stabilize buddy. them. No. <laughs> no. But if an ambulance was calling, hey, we've got somebody on your doorstep, we, they would be directed right to right. Fairview. Right. And, and Mary Alice, just for, for people that are curious and interested, like myself, um, ownership of the VA hospital, would you or Dr. Jordan, either one, explain to our viewers, I guess, to say who owns the hospital? Sure, the taxpayers own the hospital. I don't know if you want to give yeah, a little the, history of the department. Sure, the Department of Veterans Affairs is cabinet level position. We have a secretary, Secretary Bob McDonald, who serves at the pleasure of the president. And it's the Department of Veterans Affairs actually consists of three different agencies or administrations. That's the Veterans Health Administration, the Veterans Benefits Administration, and the National Cemetery Administration. So what happens, in, in most cases, what happens is a veteran will go to the Veterans Benefits Administration to determine what their benefits are, if any, and then they will come to us for their, their health care, and then one day, you know, possibly to the National Cemetery Administration. But there are also processes for emergency care for veterans who have not been through the VBA process yet. So it's, it's got a long history. It actually started, we were talking, Heath, it actually started in the late 19th century and had different names, mm -hmm. and it was an administration, a VA administration, until I believe 1991 when it became a cabinet level post. Now our hospital started construction in 1943 as a naval hospital. A lot of people don't know that. Interesting. And one of the pictures, we have a lot of old pictures and one of the ones I'm most proud of are the, the sailors actually raising yeah. the flag at the Navy Hospital Dublin for the first time. And there were a lot of reasons for having a Navy hospital here, but it was primarily so you could get soldiers during World War II somewhere that they could convalesce without having to be worried about being harassed. And actually, a lot of people also don't know that the local airport, Bud Baron Airport, was actually originally constructed to accommodate those, those sailors. And of course, it's gone on since then to do a lot of other things. But then in 19, and the Navy hospital actually opened in 1945, and then in 1948, the Veterans Administration took over the hospital. And since then, we've had a long history of caring for veterans in, in the middle Georgia area. And like Ms. Morrow said, 52 counties, 38,000 veterans in middle and south Georgia. It's, it's just, it's an honor to care for these. We call them America's heroes. And, okay. and you know, they're, we, I tell people that history lives in our halls because there will never be another Sergeant Joe Smith who was at Okinawa or whatever. And so that's why we encourage people to come for tours. So if you're interested in a tour, just give me, the, Frank Jordan, a call yeah. at 478-274. 5440 or shoot me an email at frank.jordan at va.gov and that's Jordan, J-O-R-D-A-N. We love to have people come in for tours, whether an individual or a group, especially young people. We're trying to transmit a sense of patriotism generationally to our, in our American culture and we, we want them to come see what it's all about to care and, for our veterans. And I can tell you if you've not been on a tour of the hospital, you certainly want to take a tour. There are so many wonderful things going on there. We've got so much more we want to discuss today, the um, programs and, and just lots of other things. Again, thank you both for joining me today. We're going to take a quick commercial break and then we'll be right back. What was once simple isn't so simple anymore. Yet you just can't be there for them all the time. But we can. Oh, the kettle. It's okay. I got it. At Home Instead, we understand. It's why we offer individualized care for every unique situation to keep your aging loved ones safe and sound. At home instead of anywhere else. Call or visit us at homeinstead.com slash health. Welcome back to the show. We're having a, a great conversation today with Dr. Frank Jordan and Mary Alice Morrow. Thank you both again for joining us today. Before we went to our break, we were discussing the history uh, a little bit. And during the commercial, we were having a discussion about some of that history. And I think you had one more important topic that you wanted to share with us about the history of the hospital. Yeah, the very first patient is uh, uh, a relative of one of our current residents, uh, I, I think her spouse. Yeah, All right, her spouse. Mr. Yeah. Felix Bobbitt was our first veteran ever. We actually, I have an old Kerr Herald article where they were fe featuring Mr. Bobbitt, and his story was fascinating. He was served in World War II in the Army and went to the European theater and was actually wounded twice, got wounded once, went right back into combat, and then he unfortunately got wounded again, and that wound made him wheelchair bound for the rest of his life. But he was he went on to have a wonderful life. He was a very productive citizen, and he, he came to us when he needed us. And it's just, we, we say, again, we say history walks our halls, and I try to emphasize to our folks every day, and so does Ms. Morrow, that, you know, we 
our veterans are individuals. They're unique. There's never going to be another one like this one. And, uh, and, and it, a good segue to, to tell, tell folks what we do inside mm -hmm. the walls of the Carl Vincent. We're not just a, a community hospital. We, we, our bread and butter is outpatient, outpatient medicine. We do primary care, outpatient mental health, and a whole array of specialty care, such as general surgery, cardiology, neurology, uh, to complement those outpatient services. But we also have five neighborhoods that are long-term care units. Mm -hmm. They could be for uh, palliative care, short or long-term rehabilitation. We have a dementia unit, the beautiful new eight-bed hospice unit. Uh, so we, on any given day, have um, about 160 veterans living in our neighborhoods. It's their home and their long-term skilled nursing, long-term care units. We also have a residential um, domiciliary program that really uh, is for our, our most vulnerable veterans, veterans that are experiencing homelessness, that have substance abuse disorders or problems or struggle with substances, that uh, perhaps are still struggling from PTSD, or a combination of those three. We have um, a, a program that lets them reside with us in dorm-like settings uh, and, and go through a 60 to 90 day program to help them get back on their feet, um, connect them with housing, connect them with uh, long-term uh, addiction um, uh, types of recovery programs, uh, help them deal in groups and individually with their post-traumatic stress, and uh, a lot of successful stories coming out of that can, program. And so there's about a hundred of them any day. You, you covered <laughs> half the oh. stuff on my list. <laughs> that was so good. there's so we're an active home to, to about two hundred and fifty veterans on any sure. given day. And and Mary Ellis, you guys uh, pharmacy filling over five thousand prescriptions daily. Oh yeah. Um, as well as um, uh, notice the MOVE program. So you do some preventive care. Can you talk a little bit about some of those programs? Maybe? Yeah, MOVE, MOVE, is, um, MOVE is our weight management and, and nutrition program. It's been very popular because what we, VA tries to uh, innovate and lead the industry in some of, the, some of these things, and MOVE is one of those we got in early. And what happens is we understood that a lot of our veterans who were developing diabetes and some other problems, a lot of it was related to inactivity, weight gain, and just poor nutrition. So the MOVE program, our folks work with the veterans and help them manage their weight, get active, and, and think about what they're eating. It's been very popular. We, we've got several veterans out that have had long-term success with that, and it has a direct effect on not only their health care as far as me, uh, mitigating their diabetes and other things, but also quality of life is enhanced. I, I know a good friend of mine who's a veteran who talks about it wasn't just that he got his health care in order with the MOVE program, but he also suddenly he had more energy, he's, he's sleeping better, and his whole life just got better. So More active. Yeah, it's you know, the VA tries to be on the cutting edge, if not in the forefront, uh, of preventive medicine. We're, we're establishing a relationship with our veterans. It's not episodic care. We, we catch them. Uh, I had a veteran on my show uh, the other day who's just getting out, and I, of course, I wanted to ping him about his benefits. Are you getting? And, oh yes, sure. sir, I'm getting. So it's a relationship that starts before they get out, while they're enjoying their lives, right up through actually even their death and afterward. Because we have an honors escort program at the medical center. When a veteran passes away at our medical center, we actually have a very pronounced protocol that we lead them through the medical center with great ceremony to say goodbye and show them the honor and respect they and deserve. they're draped in the American yeah, flag. Absolutely. It's just yeah. a beautiful and, thing. And along those same lines, you guys do, uh, you celebrate Nurses Week. Mm -hmm. You have a VA 2K yep. um, golf tournaments. Talk just a little bit about some of those things and, and why you do those We things. celebrate everything. And a lot <laughs> of the activities that we do, um, you know, all of the different uh, health and wellness uh, campaigns that are national. You know, mm -hmm. we participate in. We're about to launch flu shots. They're here, and <laughs> time to get a flu shot. Public service announcement: Get your flu shot. <laughs> um, uh, but, but a lot of the activities that we host is, is a way for us to invite the community inside and see That's what right. we do and get to meet and know our veterans, especially those that live with us. Um, and so we we have a Memorial Day observance. We have a Veterans Day observance. We just had a 9/11 observance at our flagpole. Uh, some some are very short programs. Some of them are an hour, hour and a half. Um, we're going to have a big fall festival coming up on the front lawn that the community is invited to attend. Um, and, and it's our way of partnering with the community uh, so that they get to know us and we have the opportunity to thank them for the support because we desperately need the support of the community to well, continue our mission. And you guys are great, not only great community supporters, chamber supporters. We enjoy a, a 
wonderful relationship with you at the VA hospital. And so anything that we can do to help promote the programming and, and what's going on at the VA. Again, if you would like to take one of these tours that Dr. Jordan mentioned, you can also contact us at the chamber and we'll put you in touch mm -hmm. with the folks over at the VA hospital um, to make sure that you can do that. Um, I don't know that we'll get to everything we have on this list to cover today. There's so many great things going on at the VA, but we need to take one more commercial break and, and then we'll come back and wrap Thank up. Thank you. Sounds good. When my husband experienced chest pain, I knew we had to go to the ER at Fairview Park Hospital because it had an accredited chest pain center. Chest pain isn't like a broken arm or a high fever. They treat chest pain like the serious condition it is, and they treat it fast. And it was a good thing we knew the difference because my husband was in cardiac arrest. Oh, I was fine. Now he is. Treat chest pain like chest pain. Choose the ER at Fairview Park Hospital. Welcome back to the show. We're going to get right back into some of our, our questions here. Uh, I wanted to ask you guys, I know from time to time people do volunteer to come work. Who can volunteer? Is there an age requirement? Um, and, and how would folks go about being a volunteer at the VA? Yeah, we're blessed to have many, many volunteers of all ages. We have the student leaders program that um, 16, I believe, mm -hmm. 16 and older. They come and volunteer with us during the summer. There is a small vetting process. We have to fingerprint and do a very uh, easy, quick background check. Um, but they can, the, the nice part about for the students is they can, if they want to be a nurse, they want to be a doctor, they can shadow our professionals and, and uh, see how, how mm -hmm. health care is delivered in, in the operating room or on any of our units. In, uh, a lot of them do our escort programs, so they're at our front desks manning and helping veterans navigate our very long hallways. Uh, so we, and we have volunteers, <clears throat> formal veteran service organizations like the American Legion, um, the Soldiers Angels mm -hmm. uh, that provide hours and hours and hours of hundreds of hours of service. Uh, we have veterans that pretty much are like full-time employees. They're there 40 plus hours a week doing, doing various volunteer work. We are always uh, uh, grateful for any time, talent, or treasure. Anybody that likes to come and sing can come and sing on one of the units for the veterans, uh, especially in our neighborhoods. There, there can be some long days for them. They love visitors. They love uh, any kind of entertainment. So some church groups come in sometimes and okay. sing, or the, the students, the ROTC, the cheerleaders, they've attended some of our events. We sent uh, uh, almost, I think, 17 or 19 veterans to the various games mm -hmm. that the VA has. We had 11 attend the wheelchair games out in Salt Lake City. We had another seven or eight attend the uh, senior, or the Golden Age games mm -hmm. in okay. Detroit. And so, you know, bringing the cheerleaders mm -hmm. in to wish them well, we kind of have a hallway parade for them. And we'll be celebrating them in October, which is uh, National Disability Awareness Month, another, okay. another month another that we event. celebrate. Right. Yes. And so pretty much any age, anybody that wants mm -hmm. to help, and, and for our, our young folks that may be viewing the program today, again, a great resume builder yes. um, oh, absolutely. To, to volunteer yeah. at the VA. Um, and, and not only volunteers, I get asked quite often, even at the chamber, I'm sure both of you probably, how would someone come to work at the VA? usajobs.com. Right. That's how you apply for all, all jobs are posted. All contract work is posted on the federal biz ops. Uh, the government um, does have very strict requirements for bidding for various jobs um, and they try to pick veteran owned small business as priorities to, to award different contracts. But the job application, uh, we do have direct hire authority for physicians, nurses, pharmacists, the, the clinicians. Uh, that work in the hospital, but the, some of the entry-level jobs can be difficult for non-veteran or non-government workers uh, because there's the veteran preference and there's, uh, you know, there's, uh, gives them a step up. And uh, the goal always for the VA is to employ as many veterans as we can. They tend to um, easily gain most of those entry-level positions, but that, not always. And so usajobs.com is how you find out what positions are, and they're always open posted positions uh, online. You have to apply online or fax in your resume, and all of that information is on usajobs.com. Okay. But so, persistence is the key. We, yes. we, we don't miss an opportunity because you're not persistent. Sometimes it takes a little while, but it's, it's a wonderful community to work in once you get in there. Absolutely. And our human resource specialists are always uh, mm -hmm. available to talk and discuss you know, the process and, and how to make your resume uh, you know, if you have the skill sets that we're looking for, how to arrange your resume uh, that will, uh, you know, give it the Maybe best opportunity it, right, to get to get right. pulled in the search. Okay. 
Two more questions, and I'm going to ask Dr. Jordan if you'll address the first one, and Mary Alice if you'll wrap up. Sure. I want you to talk just a little bit about the future. What do you see in the pipeline for the VA hospital? Any future growth, expansion, something along those lines? And then if you would, Mary Alice, just, just to wrap up um, whatever you would like to say to our, our sure. viewers about the VA hospital. Thank Dr. you. Jordan. Well, I'll probably hand off some of this to Ms. Barr, actually. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but our, growth, our growth is continuous at the VA, and, that, and that's no reason uh, not to expect that to continue in the future. You know, we've had Iraq, right. Afghanistan, and those types of things, and who knows what the future holds. So there's going to be a vibrant need for the VA and its services for years to come. And in the 13 years that I've been with the v Medical Center, Carl Vincent VA Medical Center here in Dublin, I've never seen us not have major construction going on. When I when I started, we had 743 employees, I believe, and now, as Ms. Morris said, it's close to 1,400. Not to mention the other, the other folks we draw in every day with our activities like construction and visitors. It has a huge economic impact. And I always like to point that out because I love to see people at work. I love to see mm -hmm. jobs. Jobs to me means a healthy economy and healthy America. So I love to see that. But I'll Yeah, we, you know, if you look at the signature wounds of the current wars, it's traumatic brain and PTSD, and a lot of hidden hidden wounds. And so we, we predict a, an increased continued need for mental health services. Uh, our veteran population we anticipate to level off around 2023. Um, we're in, a, in the southeast, which is a region that has grown exponentially over the last 10 to 20 years of veterans. Um, you just have to look at where the big bases are. That's where your growth is going to be because uh, as they transition out of the service, they tend to stay uh, a lot of times where, where they finish up. Not always, but and, uh, and Georgia produces quite a few mm -hmm. uh, young men and women to the services. It's a state that, that you get a lot of, a lot of um, military out of. Uh, the other thing is you've got an aging population. So the Vietnam uh, era veterans are in their 70s. Um, the, and, and uh, you, you know, Persian Gulf Wars are now. You know, as, as these large populations, the surge populations from, from war, age, uh, the need for long-term care will probably grow exponentially as well. The other thing that the VA really is on the front leading edge of in healthcare is using technology. And we use an awful lot of telehealth. We use cardiologists in the Bronx to see our patients here in Dublin. We use uh, a neurologist in Birmingham to see our patients here in Dublin. We use a dermatologist in Myrtle Beach. So we leverage uh, telemedicine uh, all the time. We, we help, it, we, we bring it into the home, uh, we bring it, uh, you know, so that it's easy for the veterans that live far away that can't necessarily travel to get the care and services they need leveraging technology. And I think that is the future. Uh, so you may not need the brick and mortar. Uh, you may, everything's going to be connected to your phone someday right. or your, or your uh, tablet. And I think that that's really uh, how we'll be able to um, make sure that we are getting the care to the, to the veterans that need it and deserve it and have earned it. Fantastic. Mary Ellis, give us a 60-second commercial for the VA hospital. Thank you. It's your VA hospital. It's our VA hospital. Um, and uh, please take the time to come and visit us, get to know the veterans that have sacrificed so much uh, for the freedoms that we all enjoy today. Thank, thank you, you so much for having us thank here. You. Thank you, Dr. Jordan, and thank, thank you, you Mary Ellis, again for, for being on the show. Thank you for joining us, and as always, we want to remind you, it's a great day for business in <laughs> Dublin and Lawrence County.